Meetings and gatherings take many forms, formal and informal, large and small, in-person and virtual. Some meetings are routine, memories of them quickly fade. Others hold greater significance. Their effects are lasting, their importance felt for years, even generations. The Society of Mary's General Chapter of 1981 was a meeting of great significance. This gathering produced a revision of the constitutions of the Society of Mary that influences Marianist brothers and priests to this day. This is the story of what led up to this important meeting, how it unfolded, and how it continues to carry the Society of Mary forward. Constitutions are the governing documents of a religious society approved by the Church. The first constitutions for the Society of Mary were submitted to the Vatican by Father Chaminade in September of 1838. Pope Gregory XVI responded in April of 1839 with a decree of praise. Though not a formal approval of the constitutions, this decree was enough for Chaminade to promote these constitutions as a rule of life for the Marianist religious. In 1839, this is where uh, uh, really the rule of life becomes uh, very clear in the Founder's mind, and it is the Foundation's piece, I think, for all constitutions that follow after that. They have to really model themselves on that. Formal approval of the Constitutions finally came in 1891. It would take until 1961, some 70 years after the Vatican's approval, for the Society of Mary to decide to make some significant revisions. Much had changed in the world and the Society by that time, and more change was to come. In 1961, Father Joseph Hofer was Superior General, and this was a year before the opening of the Vatican II. But he decided that, that we needed to uh, update our, our rule of life. Despite misgivings among some Marianists about the unrest this might cause, the General Chapter of 1961 voted almost unanimously to revise the constitutions, and elected a commission to prepare a text to be considered at the next general chapter in 1966. This movement to revise the constitutions was just what Vatican II was urging religious orders to do. Its 1965 document on the renewal of religious life, Perfecte Caritatis, laid out three principles to guide these revisions the spirit of the Gospels, the founder and the founding charism, and the needs and the signs of the times. They wanted us, besides returning to the sources, to get the spirit of our foundation once again, uh, make it alive within the communities, within ourselves, and develop Marianist spirituality. That's what this 1961 revision of the Constitutions was to consist in. By 1965, the Society of Mary was well into this task, and members awaited the next general chapter, when the draft of the revised constitutions could be reviewed before submission to the Vatican for formal approval. But along with the text prepared by the Commission, three provinces, the Andes, Cincinnati, and Saragossa, submitted their own editions of the constitutions. But at the 66th chapter, they, prevented, they presented this, uh, this copy of the Constitution. Yes. 
it, they had a great discussion, but they, they could not finish in 66. So in 67, they had another session of it's at that chapter. And in 67, this was, this uh, book was accepted ad experimentum, which means it was not submitted to the Vatican for approval. It had a lot of new things in it and so on. And, but it was ad experimentum. So a lot of the brothers didn't really take it that seriously. It wasn't definite anymore. The 1967 constitutions were, uh, there were, there were uh, different groups trying to, three different groups trying to uh, say what we want for a constitution in 1967. And as a result, even the capitulants did not do a good job in presenting the rule of life to the communities when they came back. And people were not satisfied with the 1967 rule of life, the little blue book that we had. Uh, some of the American provincials were pushing too hard, I think, and to get that uh, uh, union that we have, union without confusion. We had confusion, but no union. <laughs> I, th I think it was a, you know, it was a particularly difficult period of time. And, you know, in the midst of this turmoil, uh, they called it interim constitution, and it wasn't clear what was the <laughs> what was the moral authority of that constitution, right? So, were we following the old constitutions or the new constitution? But that, it had a, a section on it called the uh, uh, community of action. Right away, that has to be a giveaway. There we're we're not thinking about this in the deepest way possible, right? <laughs> It's not action that we're about, it's, it's mission that we're about, it's ministry that we're about, but not just action. During the late 1960s, the general administration decided that the chapter of 1971 would not work on the constitutions, but instead would deal with the issues raised through Survey SM, a questionnaire distributed to all members of the Society of Mary for their input on key areas of Marianist life and spirituality. After months of serious preparation, the 26th General Chapter began in July of 1971 in San Antonio, Texas, the first General Chapter to ever be held in the United States. With its focus on key areas of Marianist spirituality, the chapter produced the wonderful document, Response, which covered topics central to Marianist religious life. At the chapter of 1971, there was a great breakthrough. This was, I think, the beginning of what would wind up in the rule of life. It was called a response. And there was so much enthusiasm at that 1971 chapter that I don't think it was ever at that high level, even at the 1981 approval of the concept. That was the best chapter that I was at, and um, I don't think the others since that time have ever come ever near to it. When Father Tudis was elected in 1971, it was though somebody hit a Grand Slam home run. The whole assembly of Marianists gathered there just stood up and cheered and clapped. A turning point was that kind of olive-looking document there called Response. And in that, you began to see some things starting to emerge in the, what was document number seven, the Marianus Apostolate. And again, began to focus on this, the, that the role of society of Mary was this, this multiplication of Christians. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, began to say, okay, let's get down. What is it fundamentally that we're trying to do? It's this formation of faith, the multiplication of Christians. How do we go about that? And, you know, coming out of Vatican Council II, uh, and Steve was very big on this, is that our mission had to be embedded in the mission of the church. We had to really think about how we were going to be part of the church uh, was an important. The concept of our mission having this Marian character the sense of her, you know, shaping the way we did mission, 
you know, her gifts of hospitality, her gifts of strong faith, uh, those were all important in that, in that process. The introductory letter in response by the newly elected Superior General, Father Stephen Tudis, stated the importance of this chapter. The work of the chapter is really intended to provide an ongoing, progressive development of the Marianist way of life. In this sense, the 1971 General Chapter is definitively the beginning of a new phase in the life of the Society of Mary. No, no chapter will, will be as great as that 1971, because what they did, they took all of this uh, this taste for the rule of 1967 and uh, sort of studied it from a sociological and a modern point of view and said, this is what's happening in our world today. What do we see as strategies for uh, taking the good out of it and eradicating the bad? So there was, there were uh, ways in which the response was written that got everybody involved because it was talking about the, what we call the signs of the times. And that maybe was the emphasis of the response. And as a result, everybody got into that because it was the spirit of Vatican II now coming alive in a religious congregation. And it was just a magnificent chapter. This general chapter concluded with a mandate to the general administration to submit a plan for the writing of the constitutions to the 1976 chapter. The general chapter of 1976, in its document, New Call, outlined this plan quite clearly. Each province was to elect one member to the Constitution's Commission, or COMCO, that in turn was to oversee and give direction to the Writing Commission, known as the Redaction Committee, or REDCO. The elected members of COMCO nominated members for REDCO, from which the General Administration appointed three. Father Eduardo Benyoc, Father David Fleming, and Father Bernard Vial. Each had a good working knowledge of the three major languages in the society, Spanish, English, and French. From all that had been gathered from Survey SM and from the chapter of 1971, as stated in response, along with the directives from COMCO, the three members of REDCO wrote a draft of the constitutions for COMCO to review. A revised draft was then distributed to each member of the Society of Mary. Next to each article were the numbers 1, strongly agree, up to 5, strongly disagree. Each brother was to vote on and to comment on each article. The members of COMCO and REDCO reviewed all the input. REDCO then wrote a capitulate draft that was submitted to the general chapter of 1981. Well, my memory, of course, is the whole thing of getting the chapter yeah. or getting the rule of life uh, accepted because we had worked on that for the previous oh. five years and we worked on it, you know, word by word since I was on that little committee. And then, you know, to see it go through and see some changes made, but good changes. For the first time in the history of the Society of Mary, the entire membership had a hand in the writing of the constitutions known as the rule of life. After nearly two decades of work to revise the rule of life, delegates to the general chapter of 1981 finally convened in Linz, Austria on July 15th to finalize this revision. So then in 81 we got together and the whole focus of the chapter of 81 was on uh, writing this rule of life and approving it word for word, uh, article by article. There are, 114 articles, I think, in the in the rule that was approved. And so everything had to be gotten through and everything had to be voted on by everyone. 
but now the question was, how to begin this daunting task? It was made clear to us at the beginning, once we decided to take the text and work on it that had been produced uh, in 1979, there was a bit of a de debate because some people didn't like some things, other people didn't like other things, so on and so forth. But when they faced the stark alternative, namely starting from scratch, I think uh, sanity prevailed and we said, okay, we'll work with this text. Now, um, once that decision was made, uh, commissions were formed. Um, it was made clear that everything was going to have to somehow be an embryonic state, at least in the first uh, chapter of the rule. All the key things of, of the foundation, uh, Shamanad, uh, Mary, uh, community, mission, and uh, the issue of stability. Um, and we were told that we really had to work hard and quickly um, because we wanted to, to uh, be able within, the chapter was six weeks long. So we wanted to be able within maybe the first two weeks to have a text pretty well agreed upon by everybody so that when they worked on the subsequent chapters, uh, which would elaborate the different elements in chapter one, they would have a frame of reference to work with. The group succeeded, setting the stage for the other commissions to take up their work of writing the remaining chapters. Chapter one, uh, which a number of the Americans also worked on, uh, was is very unified. So if you look at chapter one, it has the themes all the way through. And so it's kind of an integrative document, which I really found very helpful. I would say most of it went very smoothly. People agreed on uh, what we said about Mary and what we said about religious life and the vows and community and prayer and so on. Discussion about chapter five on mission was a notable exception to the otherwise smooth proceedings, bringing to light a range of opinions. The commission for chapter five was a diverse group, which had its advantages. What made us some difference, I think, in the, the work that we were doing in chapter five, first of all, um, just the global nature of the assembly. So we had people from uh, you know, South America, from Europe, uh, some, some from Africa, uh, giving us insights in different ways. And I think uh, while I had a lot of sensitivity for social justice issues coming into the, into the chapter, um, it was great to hear what was happening in, in South America in terms of their concerns about the poor and uh, those type of things. Soon, three different schools of thought emerged regarding the true mission of the Society of Mary. I mean, if there were camps, it was a big camp on schools, one on what I'd call a kind of the lay family of Mary, and then there was a kind of a social justice, transformation of society, liberation type of groups. Per, you know, the lay communities are the preferred means of sharing our charism, in education, and it's been a privileged means of carrying out our mission. So I think trying to reconcile those two, maybe not done perfectly, but then trying to, how can we do both of those? And, and then this introduction of peace and justice, you know, helping to build a just and fraternal society. Um, I think that was, that was something new but it was controversial because those words were never used before in respect to our Marianist apostolate. But I do think it came out of Chaminade's insight of the French Revolution of where he was trying to rebuild the structures of society through everything from book clubs to visiting the prisoners and jail and lots of things. And so people felt there was a strong continuity there in that, in that whole process. Social justice was was, was in the uh, was fomenting in society in general. If Father Free's famous uh, 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 thesis on social virtues uh, was was just a, a new way of thinking, and I think that that's why in the farmer constitutions we didn't have anything about social justice. 
but it wasn't in the society in general very much either. Despite these diverse opinions, the commission managed to pull together all these viewpoints into a single cohesive framework. I think the breakthrough that came through was the focus on the charism as, as you know, Article 5.4 and 5.5 and so on. It talked about the, set the role for um, the notion of the Marianist family being the focus of our, of our ministries. And then what the breakthrough on the commission was, well, let's just look at different things that our people were doing. So pastoral ministry, the school, uh, and so on. And, you know, we got to that issue around uh, building a uh, just and fraternal society. We just picked up the work that was done in response and shaped it into some articles. One important and challenging element of the general chapter was the need to express these important ideas in various languages. There was simultaneous translation during the group sessions of the chapter, and the three-member team of Redco wrote drafts of articles in the three working languages, English, French, and Spanish. When working across different languages and cultures, however, Communication can be tricky. You know, English was the official language of the chapter. And uh, Father Faree wrote up a, a paper, and I, I don't remember what, what uh, on what subject, but he wrote it up. It was translated into Spanish. And the French translated it from the Spanish into French. So there, there were these copies around and Father Faree happened to pick up a copy of the fr French. And he said at the end, who wrote this? He said, you know, th this sounds very much like the, the one I read. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see what translations uh, uh, do to things. <laughs> you know, there's a, an interesting translation too. Uh, Article 59, for me, is the most inspiring in the, in the book, it, and it starts like this, it's in English. In every Marianist community, we aim to live in such a way that the presence of God is felt. And if you want the, the, the Spanish translation, Spanish says uh, uh, that the presence of God is manifest. One is a little bit more external than the other. <laughs> Right. And and uh, it's ju it's just just interesting to me the, the the translations really do make a difference. The nature of one's vocation within the Society of Mary was also a major topic of discussion, resulting in more changes in the constitutions. The three categories also came in <laughs> the three categories because you know in the, in the old constitution it was very clear there were there was priests there were teaching brothers and there were working brothers see in the time of father shamanad the working brothers really were not not educated they didn't have uh, they didn't have much studies they were they were excellent carpenters and workshop people and so on and that started to disappear in the time of father hofer I already said, no, they're, they're, you can't make that distinction anymore because uh, the, the work has changed so much. For example, if you have a highly educated uh, brother who works completely in technology, you know, computer expert, he's not a teacher, uh, he's not a priest, uh, he's really not a He's not a working brother in the sense he's not in manual work. And so that started to disappear. And now in, in this uh, present time, in our constitutions, <laughs> Article 13, Article 69, describe three groups, uh, the, min the priestly ministry, the culture, educational area, and the people that are 
uh, are devoted to uh, to work, but technical work <laughs> and so on. So, so it's not three categories anymore. It's it's just, it's kind of three groups. In Article seventy four, it does say that education is our privilege to postulate. So it, it does it does keep the emphasis on education, but we don't have those distinctions so much anymore. Because we were in the era of Vatican II, and there was a lot of uh, what would I say um, orientation towards not making such hard distinctions between a brother that was in the that had the working category and a brother that was in the teaching category. Those those distinctions kind of uh, what I say, uh, were not as well accepted at the time of the chapters. That's why I think the difference has changed. I think what was taken in the, by the by the chapter at that time was to say, okay, what's the function of the different areas as opposed to calling one group working brothers, one group teaching brothers. So I, I think, I thought we came up with a good, good solution to it, but obviously it wasn't good enough to get everybody unanimously behind it. But at the time, there was this, why were we making distinctions among the brothers? That, that was, that's what I think. But what of the distinctions between the ordained and those not ordained? What roles are reserved for each? This mixed composition of brothers and priests has been a distinguishing feature of the Society of Mary dating back to its foundation. There has always been one Marianist vocation, and as Article 13 states, the Marianist community seeks to portray a more faithful image of the church. It rejoices in the mutual enrichment this mixed composition brings to its community and mission. But when the chapter members considered the possibility of a brother being appointed as provincial, there was concern about how this might be viewed by the Vatican. There were some of the, some of the members were really afraid to uh, change anything about the uh, mixed composition. It came up that we wanted to change uh, the positions that were reserved to priests. Before it was, it was superior general, provincial and a novice master and then uh, uh, in the chapter we we pared that down to uh, to just the superior general and there were members who wanted to 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 make that open also but there were people uh, like father Vesey he said if we touch that the vatican is going to come back and make us decide whether we are clerical or lay, because those are the two categories in, in canon law. And it's it's true, every time we have uh, had to submit our, our rule to the Vatican for approval, uh, we had a big discussion with the Vatican over this. In the end, the chapter members reached an agreement and the chapter came to a close. And by the end of it, uh, we have the whole thing approved. People thought it was a very uh, momentous moment. I remember Father Lemire, who was then the French head of religious life uh, and a member of the, of the GA before that, uh, getting up and saying, now, you know, this is like back in 1891 when our rule of life was first approved. Now we've come to something really new and you know, he got us all up and we all sang the Magnificat when we finished it and all that. So that was uh, very significant. Father Vesey was right to have been concerned. Formal approval would not happen until 1983. And, but for the support of Cardinal Peronio, the head of the Vatican Office for Religious Life, it may not have happened at all. Cardinal Peronio was a was a great uh, supporter of us, and he kept saying, "Stick with it, stick with it, don't don't give in." 
He was a great friend of the Marianists, and he had been supporter of uh, of the Marianists, and he'd known them quite well in Argentina, and appreciated us a lot. And so, he was the head of the uh, religious life committee at that time in the in the Vatican for the Pope. But uh, he was on his way out because a lot of people thought he was too liberal and too open to too many things. And so in 1983, he was ready to approve. But he he said, we better get this finalized quickly or his successor will come and he will not approve of it. Especially a brother as provincial or a brother as novice master. Uh... I was, I remember I was on a visitation, I was a provincial at that time in St. Louis, and I was on a visitation in India, and I got a phone call from Rome saying, come back to Rome quickly, and we have to do a final version, a few little details, and uh, then we'll send this right away to to this committee, and they will approve it before Cardinal uh, is uh, kicked out. <laughs> And so we did that. We came to Rome, the three of us. We had a few little, we didn't have many changes to make, but we had a few little things to do. And then they submitted the final text to the Congregation for Religious in the Vatican, and it was approved. And uh, very shortly after that, within a month or two, the Cardinal was removed. So, and it's quite true, quite clear that if his successor had been in charge, he would not have approved the Marianist rule of life. I remember being at a, a meeting of the superiors general once in Rome uh, when the Franciscans were also asking the Vatican to approve some um, changes in their rule that... that uh, Brothers could be superiors of communities and so on. And uh, I was at a meeting in which the, uh, there was a Father Torres who was the, the, the canon lawyer of, the, of the, the congregation of religious. And this, this subject came up and some people said, well, uh, what's the problem here and so on. And, and one of them said, well, the Marianists, and Father Torres said, the Marianists are an asterisk in the canon law. We're an exception. And, and that was that way. Other than a slight revision to the rule in 2006, the rule that was approved by the general chapter of 1981 remains largely unchanged. It continues to govern the Society of Mary to this day, proving itself to be a document that challenges and inspires. The Society of Mary's General Chapter of 1981 was indeed a meeting of great significance. It provoked a variety of immediate reactions and lasting effects. Father Joseph Verrier, who is a uh, well, a very rec- respected and loved uh, master of our of our spirit, well, he he was really afraid of the new uh, rule of life, and I was living with him in Rome when the new rule was approved. And he didn't say anything, but after he read it for a while, he said, well, actually, it turned out much better than I thought it would. <laughs> so it was very, very, very good. Being able to be part of that discussion and even recognize certain lines that you wrote yourself or you contributed to, um, I don't know, it gives you a, a certain sense of... Uh, not really satisfaction as much as being an instrument. We were entering a new era. I think our 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 chapter put us on a on a on a cutting edge of the religious life. I think we had picked up the, the fundamental issues. Um, we had to be involved in social action. 
that was a hard, hard haul. Um, that took time. I and it came up on every chapter after chapter, but I think we we entered into that. Um, I think we recognized faintly our own um, mixed composition as a special gift. Um, I think the development of the laity was, was a was a great great step, but we have to work on those. They're, they're not we're not there yet, but we have, we have a thing in place. I just felt. Like this was, a, you know, it just was very enriching for my religious life. The emphasis on uh, faith, on community life, and all that integrated into our apostolic, you know, formation of people, uh, apostolic, you know, uh, faith connections. The integration was just very exciting. And I said, this is, this is something that really I find very enriching. I came back from it just so energized and so positive about where we were going as a religious community. And I still, today, reading it, I say, you know, if we live up to that, we're, we're going to be pretty powerful force in the church. So that's that's a feeling I came away with. I like the present rule of life more than the, the old one. <laughs> it, it, has, it has a lot of very uh, deep spirituality. There's a lot of spirituality in our rule. You can take that to meditation, and uh, it's not just uh, rules and regulations, conduct. It's the living values and spirit, uh, spirits, especially our relationship with Mary, our relationship with one another. Uh, if, one, if, you, if you take that seriously, it seems to me it's, it's, it's stronger in some things than, than in the, the old Constitution. There's a missionary dimension to our community life now. I said before, I don't think we've really taken that up too, too seriously, but, but it's there, and it keeps calling us. It didn't, it didn't immediately give you know, all kinds of new energy to everything, but it gave a new f framework for understanding what we're about. There's no better way to understand what the Society of Mary is all about than to read from Article 2, Chapter 1 of their Rule of Life. In calling us to be Marianists, God asks us to follow in a special way Jesus Christ, Son of God, become Son of Mary for the salvation of all. Our goal is to be transformed into His likeness and to work for the coming of his kingdom. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcero, Espes Nostra Salve, A te clamamos, Exules Filii Heve, a te suspiramus, gementes et fuentes, in ad lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, ilos tuos, misericordes oculos, a nos converte. Et Jesu, Benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, O 